Welcome. Welcome everyone to uh, the ongoing series where we're trying to explore the implications of big data in psychology. Now, for those of you uh, that come from a psychology background, you'll be well aware of the sort of the history of research methods and methodologies that go back to introspection as an initial technique or approach to make sense of how we experience the world through the development of behaviorism, eventually cognitive science and uh, related methodologies such as advanced instrumentation and so on that are increasingly prominent in really all areas of uh, human uh, behavior research. One of the questions that I think drives us in hosting this particular series is the question of to what degree can traditional methods of research in psychology and sort of the almost hallowed experimental design approaches, to what degree can then be augmented through big data models? So questions could be, can cognitive states such as attention and mind wandering be reflected in log data? Or can social interactions and affect be modeled, mapped, and understood based on some of the language data that's generated as individuals interact with one another and so on? So this is the second of a series. We did one about, uh, I guess, maybe about a month ago or so, where we looked specifically at a overlap with learning analytics as a field, which uh, Justin and I represent through the University of Technology University of Texas in Arlington. I don't know where I've got technology out of the deal. Um, and we're located within um, the Department of Psychology. And our program, which Justin will talk about in just a minute, is unique globally. I think quite often these kinds of uh, analytics kinds of events are hosted in more education-oriented faculty. But I think the uh, leadership within UTA, at least, and certainly within the uh, chair uh, of Perry Fuchs, who's in our session here today as well, of psychology, um, have been able to do is provide us a space where we can explore this from a very deep human subjects end and the effect of data science and understanding human behavior, understanding human cognitive processes, social systems, and uh, broader IO systems as well. So I think there's tremendous potential for big data to augment and in some cases even replace some of the research practices that are ongoing within the do domain of uh, psychology in general. What we want to do now is the second kickoff. We have a series of uh, speakers planned coming in the future as well. So early next year, those of you that are on the mailing list, you'll hear from us as these uh, presentations are uh, beginning to unfold and begin to be planned. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to pass this over to a colleague, Justin Dillinger, to introduce the Learning Analytics Learning Network, as well as the Master of Science in Learning Analytics, and then our guest speaker today. So thank you all for joining us. I think there's tremendous capability uh, going forward for the field of psychology as a whole to adopt some of the techniques that exist within the big data domain. And this is part of our ongoing exploration of what might that look like practically. Justin, over to you. Great. Thanks, George. So I'm Justin Dellinger. I'm the Learning Analytics Program Coordinator here in the Department of Psychology at UT Arlington. And um, I just wanted to uh, share. So our, our program um, is sponsoring this event and um, as well as the Department of Psychology um, and the Learning Analytics Learning Network. Uh, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about each of those, there's a QR code, a link, and a Twitter handle there. So uh, please definitely take a look at that for our Master of Science program. We're currently recruiting a cohort for uh, what would be our spring uh, 2022 as well as fall 2023. So definitely get up. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, we additionally we do have a number of events coming up, as George mentioned, um, looking at corporate learning analytics, learning analytics um, and leadership, um, as well as our psychology and learning analytics series for um, LALN. Um, we have an event tomorrow um, looking at the role of language in processes and products of learning analytics um, out of Georgetown. Um, Pete Smith, our chief analytics officer at UTA, is also a part of the panel for that session. We have another session in January on responsible learning analytics. Um, as well as uh, two other sessions um, that will take place in February and, and a little bit beyond that, um, focus on um, equity and um, equ equitable learning um, through um, simulations and using AI uh, classifiers to be able to help with that, particularly geared towards um, teacher uh, teachers who are interested in, um, in, in, in using that. And then um, an introduction to causal models for learning analytics, and that will be out of uh, University of Technology, Sydney. 
So um, without uh, any further ado, I'd like to go ahead and turn this over to why you're really here, which is uh, Dr. Lewis Tay. Um, he is the uh, William Byam Associate Professor of Industrial and Organizational Psychology at Purdue University. Uh, he's the co-editor of books in big data uh, and psychological research, as well as a handbook of well-being, um, founder of the tech startup ExpoWell um, that advances science. Um, and he also is associate editor of organizational research methods and is the director of the well-being and Me measurement lab at um, Purdue University. So again, I don't want to uh, take any more time, turn it over to him and Lewis, forfeit. Um, one last thing, if, if you have any questions, um, we're going to take all the questions at the end of the session. You can put it in the chat, but we'll, we'll address it all at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Justin, for uh, the kind introduction, and I appreciate um, the invitation to present today. Um, as mentioned, I'll be um, talking about big data and um, psychology. So before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, this talk that I'll be presenting is based on a lot of my collaborative work with uh, collaborators Sang Wu, uh, Louis Hickman, Brandon Booth, and Sydney DeMello. I'm also very grateful for uh, the funding from the National Science Foundation and the PSYOP Anti-Racism Grant um, with research on machine learning, uh, really helping uh, our research on machine learning uh, measurement and machine learning measurement bias, which I'll be discussing in part uh, for this talk. So what I hope to cover today, uh, a few key points. Um, one is uh, with regard to big data and data science, uh, how can it uh, benefit um, psychology? Um, next, I'll be talking uh, more about big data uh, measurement within psychology as it's becoming more and more prevalent, both within experimental lab um, settings and also more kind of quote unquote in the wild. Um, and then I will be uh, talking a little bit about uh, my own work in terms of how psychological research on measurement can contribute to um, the issues of uh, machine learning measurement bias. <clears throat> and then I'll talk a little bit about some practical recommendations. I'm sure many of you uh, attending this are interested in machine learning applications, or at least be, be users of machine learning uh, measurements or assessments. So I'll provide some recommendations uh, based on how we would evaluate whether machine learning uh, has measurement bias and what we might be able to do about it. And then finally, I'll um, open it up for uh, Q&A. So I want to start first with the broader context of big data and data science. And I hope to convince you of its importance in psychology and also set the stage for um, big data measurement. So what is big data? Um, many of you might be already familiar with um, the three Vs, right? Volume, just the amount of data that is out there um, that is available now, uh, both recorded and stored. The variety of data that we have, uh, video, voice, text, so forth. Uh, the velocity of the data as well. So the idea that we have lots and lots of data coming in uh, all at once. Uh, fascinating thing, I've been doing some research on this and I found that some people have even talked about uh, 42 Vs of big data. Uh, I wonder what all those Vs are. Uh, is it Vogue or Voodoo or something like that? Um, well, the term big data is often used uh, synonymously with uh, data science as well. Uh, although big data often emphasizes, you know, the data part. Uh, and good old Wikipedia, as you can see the definition that I've put up, uh, that data science really is an interdisciplinary field, and I've kind of highlighted several things to note here. Um, the focus really is on scientific methods and processes. So not merely just the idea that we are dealing with data, but we're really trying to use scientific methods and approaches here um, to extract information from the data, right? So extracting knowledge. Um, and so there are these different aspects that are important in data science, and often big data is also used again, to cover things that are talked about in data science. So within psychology, uh, we often think of big data as um, a couple of things. One is really kind of going beyond the traditional assessment or measurement paradigm of self-report surveys to start to look at uh, quote unquote actual 
behaviors, right? So the ability to look at video data, uh, objective health data, uh, such as brain imaging, uh, ambulatory assessments, behavioral trace data, internet usage, voice and text, and then also uh, large scale sources of behavioral data. So now, you know, being able to see what people are searching en masse um, at a societal level, uh, social media data, for instance, web scraping, public cameras, and even a business and health records. Um, my colleagues, um, Sang Wu and Robert Proctor have defined uh, big data as, you know, multiplying multi-form data. So we have both structured data and unstructured data and um, the supporting technological infrastructure. So the capture, storage, and processing of all of that data, and also the analytical techniques as well. Um, that include uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning um, that really uh, can help enhance um, psychological research. So I'll be talking a little bit about how I think uh, it can help really improve our science within psychology. Um, as much as I've made a career out of um, tests and surveys, I think that the next frontier uh, for psychology is going to be uh, big data and data science where we start to look at uh, quote unquote actual behaviors. I love this article by Roy Baumeister and colleagues uh, who mentioned, uh, who talked about psychology as the science of self reports and finger movements. Because so much of what we rely on as data are really uh, self report assessments or what people do in front of a computer in terms of clicks. And so um, within the area of my study, which is IO psychology, I believe that you know, one dimension of distinction between uh, psychology and ma um, management is going to be analytics itself. And I hope that more space in top tier journals um, will be uh, focused on the use of um, these types of organic data um, and allow for more inductive approaches uh, to our science as well by using or leveraging all the data that is available out there. Um, the other thing too is that big data allows us to have access to really larger samples that hopefully can uh, reduce the problems of reproducibility. Uh, for some of you who have uh, followed the news about you know, reproducibility of science in general and also psychology in particular, uh, the reliance on small samples can create large sampling variability, so we can't have uh, good estimates of those effects. And by using uh, big data, we can hopefully overcome a part of that and allow for more uh, replicable estimates and reproducible science. Um, it's also been observed that within psychology and other related social sciences, uh, we often rely on weird samples. And uh, what does weird stand for? So uh, Joseph Heinrich and colleagues talked about the use of Western educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic samples. Um, and it's less known whether our findings can actually generalize to non-weird samples. Um, with big data, the hope is that we can more easily uh, include non-weird samples. For example, Twitter captures individuals who are of lower socioeconomic status than college samples within the United States. Um, and in one of my grants where we're using Twitter to look at uh, expressions of gratitude to God, uh, we can examine how individuals around the world really express their thoughts and beliefs. Um, and so while these big data samples might not be representative, uh, they might provide uh, greater insights to individuals from just different backgrounds. Um, also in 2012, um, APA President Suzanne uh, Bennett wrote that science is becoming more and more interdisciplinary because many of the research problems, as well as the major challenges facing society are so complex that they cannot be answered by a single discipline. So the use of big data uh, requires a level of cross-disciplinary collaboration for psychologists. Um, also, as I will share shortly as an illustration, psychologists have thought a lot about issues of measurement that hopefully can advance um, the use of big data within the assessment and measurement context and also machine learning measurement by this. So I hope that uh, through this talk, you can kind of see the importance of big data for our field, 
Uh, more importantly, I hope we can all actively participate in shaping the field of big data and data science from the perspective of psychology as well. So I want to move next into uh, big data measurement. Um, so George had posed the question, you know, what, what does uh, big data uh, do or data science do for um, psychology? I think that one important uh, feature is that we can leverage big data to enhance measurement in psychological science because measurement is really foundational to all that we do. We're trying to assess attributes of individuals, whether in the lab setting, experimental research, design, correlational research, longitudinal research, uh, you name it, right? The idea is that if we can measure something well, then we can know whether we've actually moved the needle, quote unquote. Uh, Lord Kelvin, a physicist who contributed to the first and second law of thermodynamics, by whom we also have our absolute temperature scale, the Kelvin scale named after, right? Uh, noted, um, he said, uh, when you can measure what you're speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. But when you cannot measure it, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. It may be the beginning of knowledge, but you have scarcely in your thoughts advanced to the stage of science. So at least I think that we can see its applicability within kind of the quantitative research um, tradition. The um, ability for us to be able to quantify something allows us to start looking at ways to generalize phenomenon and to see whether uh, the interventions we have designed or uh, the groups that we're trying to compare um, are actually different or whether we have helped quote unquote move the needle. So by leveraging big data, we can now start to use uh, multiply multi-form data and advanced analytical techniques for the measurement of individual attributes uh, really in an innovative manner, especially going beyond self-report surveys. So the endeavor of measurement um, in psychology uh, is typically understood as putting numbers on abstract phenomena, or in other words, to scale individuals on some kind of common metric. So things like uh, general mental ability or personality, um, self-efficacy, and so on and so forth. Um, another way of viewing measurement is the use of data to infer some attribute of an individual. Uh, specifically, with regard to big data measurement, uh, there are two aspects to this. One is with regard to the raw data, uh, and these can be video, voice, text, and so forth. Uh, we're extracting high-level representations, quote-unquote features, that are usable by a computer, and this process is known as feature computation. Uh, we're also using an inferential or inference procedure where we're using alg algorithmic structures within a computational model to, and estimated parameters such as regression weights to infer uh, somebody's scores uh, on personality, general mental ability, and other attributes. So in terms of uh, algorithmic structures, uh, what we're talking about uh, is the good old regression structure, for instance, a regression equation. Um, and this uh, can be applied within, for instance, support vector machine can be applied in a regression manner as well as what you can see uh, below here. Um, and then there's also a rule-based or tree-based structures such as decision trees, uh, Bayesian structures or neural network structures as seen uh, from the neural network and convoluted neural network structures here visualization. So in our recent paper in Current Directions, my colleagues, um, the Mello, Southwell, and I compiled, uh, compiled really illustrative studies that have utilized machine learning uh, computational models for measuring psychological constructs of interest, as you can see from this figure. Um, on the horizontal axis, what we have are Newall's uh, band of action for sensing modality. So starting from the biological band to the cognitive, to the rational and social, all these are reflecting different levels of timings and in some ways mapping different classes of constructs of individual attributes that we're interested in. Um, further, you can see that this applies to different domains of uh, assessment on the horizontal axis. So the psycho, um, psych physiological and uh, physical, the cognitive and affective, the applied, so these are areas like 
IO psychology, educational psychology, and more broadly, personality and social psychology. So uh, physiological and physical has things like assessing sleep from physiology in terms of cognitive uh, and affective, looking at mind wandering, as uh, George had mentioned, from eye tracking um, to the applied, looking at assessing personality from video interviews, um, and then uh, looking at um, social media uh, to assess things like depression uh, at a societal level, well-being, uh, and so forth. Um, moreover, as you can see from these different uh, shades of uh, circles here, um, these studies are done in a variety of contexts and um, in terms of the lab, in terms of online, in terms of in the wild as well. So in short, psychology is now increasingly leveraging big data to do big data measurement. Uh, it's been applied to a variety of contexts and applied to a variety of psychological constructs as well. Um, even as psychology seeks to use big data and big data measurement across uh, different areas, we're also contributing to big data by asking key questions about validity and reliability to these um, approaches. Um, with regard to uh, validity, uh, as we're kind of using organic data or data out in the wild that are not uh, well structured, uh, you know, we need to ask questions as psychologists. Um, does the data reflect the psychological construct of interest, right? Um, does it actually map on what we want to measure? So for example, does the social media like button reflect agreeableness of individuals? Is that something that we are positing? Um, the next question would, might be, you know, are the features computed from raw data reflective of the psychological construct of interest? So, for example, when we're computing facial features, uh, we may be using configuration of image pixels to make inferences about whether an individual is smiling or not. Uh, and it's important to know that there's a really a gap between the inputs that the computers receive in terms of the features that are computed versus what the raw data show. So we need to be very mindful of that gap. Uh, in thinking about the validity of big data measurements. And then there's also the inference process too. Is the machine learning model accurately predicting the construct of interest? Uh, for example, you know, many of the machine learning models might have predictive accuracies of psychological constructs such as personality in the range of 0.3 to 0.5 correlations. Um, and is it adequate enough to really say that we are measuring the construct? And with regard to reliability, um, with organic data, we need to ask the question, what's the reliability of the sensors and the infrastructure used in the collection of the data itself? For example, it's been shown that um, sensor differences can mask individual differences to some degree. So when we're trying to infer individual differences, these actually might be sensor differences rather than individual differences. Or that changes in terms of what providers decide to share can impact the types of data or the amounts of data we have access to over time. For example, um, there's been some complaints about this that YouTube has now abandoned the dislike button. And so are we still able to use that as a data point in our big data measurements? Probably not. Um, the other piece is in terms of the inference process too. Uh, are different algorithms providing similar predictive accuracies or are these uh, very algorithmic specific in terms of their predictive accuracies. So we think about this idea of inter-algorithm um, accuracy. And finally, we still need to ask traditional questions, like what is the test-retest reliability of big data measurements? For example, if we're using video data to assess the hireability of individuals in a work context, uh, if we're bringing the same individual over multiple times, does the big data measurement um, show stability in terms of the assessments over time, or is there very uh, large fluctuations? If so, um, this, this shows that it's probably going to be less reliable and less accurate than uh, what we might believe. So uh, psychology is not only contributing to uh, big data by addressing measurement issues, we're also contributing to big data and data science in the realm of uh, measurement bias too which is what I'll be um, presenting uh, in this section here. Um, so within the big data and data science space, one of the big concerns right now is fairness and bias in AI and uh, machine learning. So the forefront right, of data science, engineering, and so forth. And um, both the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health have developed programs 
uh, and principles um, around the use of machine learning with respect to bias and fairness. Um, the European Parliament has developed governance frameworks for addressing bias and transparency in the algorithms and also in China too. So this is happening uh, really illustratively worldwide. So there is a huge concern for uh, these um, big data measurements in terms of fairness and bias. If you look into the data science, big data literature, uh, fairness and bias are often used interchangeably. Uh, but within the psychometric and psychological assessment literature, fairness is really distinct from bias. bias. And um, we've thought a lot about measurement and, and psychology for uh, quite some time. And so according to you know, the principles for the validation and use of personnel selection procedures adopted as a policy statement of the American Psychological Association, fairness is a social concept. And this is also in the standards for um, educational and psychological testing too. And there are four definitions of uh, fairness laid out. Uh, one is in terms of uh, quote unquote equal group outcomes, uh, meaning that the assessment has to yield the same scores for different subgroups. Uh, the principles and standards actually reject this definition of fairness. Uh, it, it, the, the lack of um, equivalent group outcomes for the assessment may be a scrutiny for possible underlying biases, but it's not bias itself. Uh, for example, given systemic inequality, we would actually expect that an unbiased assessment would reveal group differences. Just like COVID tests reveal group differences, does not mean that the test itself is biased, but it actually reflects an underlying condition. The other aspects uh, include you know, equitable treatment, so access to practice materials, retaking opportunities for all individuals, uh, and then access to constructs, the idea that we want to ensure that other characteristics like language does not restrict access to the construct being measured at hand, and also a lack of measurement and predictive bias, which is what I'll be focusing on. So um, there are two, or should I say three aspects in terms of uh, bias that is defined uh, in psychology. Um, one is measurement bias. So the idea here is that how are observed item scores related to latent scores? And are they equivalent between subgroups? So these items could be items on uh, a survey, for instance, and are they related to the psychological construct of interest equivalently across subgroups. This is differentiated from predictive bias, which is if you're measuring something like personality, uh, and let's say it's conscientiousness, does it predict in the same manner across subgroups, uh, let's say black and white individuals or black and white students in terms of the criterion construct, which might be in terms of graduation uh, from college. Right? Um, and uh, these forms of biases, measurement and predictive biases, are also distinguished from other human judgment biases called social cognitive biases, which is found in human cognitive errors and judgments or attributions, or human preferences for in-group and prejudices against out-groups. With regard to uh, machine learning measurement bias, we are focusing here primarily on measurement bias itself. So if there's measurement bias, um, there's going to be a differential relation between the latent score of interest or the psychological construct of interest as represented here on the horizontal axis um, and the uh, vertical axis, right? Which is the um, scores that the assessments provide. So in this case, what you see here is that even when there's the same latent score uh, distribution for each subgroup, if there is measurement bias, meaning that there are different regression lines linking um, the latent score of the psychological construct to what we actually see that the assessment provides in the observed scores, we would see two different distributions, even though the underlying distribution is the same. So that is the definition of uh, measurement bias. So it's often empirically manifested when the same latent score yields uh, two different observed scores by virtue of subgroup membership and nothing else. So the question is, how do we apply you know, this psychological or psychometric concept of measurement bias to machine learning? 
uh, we kind of need to kind of go through a little bit in terms of how typically these are currently applied within psychology, where a lot of uh, researchers are using trained supervised machine learning uh, models for assessments. Uh, what we typically do is, you know, we extract features from unstructured data, such as video, social media, and these features, for instance, from video data might be verbal data, paraverbal and nonverbal data. Um, and then we also have some kind of measurement of a psychological construct that we're trying to use these features to predict. And we often call it ground truth, right? It's not really truth uh, in, a, in a sense of the capital T truth, but really just the outcome that we're trying to predict from using these uh, organic data or unstructured data. And then we're using these features to create an algorithm to best predict the ground truth score. So here we can see that the features are in orange. Um, just gonna show this here. Um, that are typically extracted from some kind of platform. So this could be social media, videos, so forth. And then what we're trying to do is to use those features to predict ground truth um, data, uh, typically assessed through a uh, survey methodology. So machine learning measurement bias, um, paralleling what we see in terms of traditional measurement bias, occurs when we have the same ground truth score distribution uh, for each subgroup, uh, but then the machine learning model assessment gives us two different subgroup distributions, as we can see here. So as you can see, the two subgroup lines are different, resulting in individuals with the same subgroup score on the horizontal axis, which is the ground truth score on something like personality, yielding two different levels of scores um, by virtue of using your machine learning model to assess the individual. Again, simply because they are in two different groups, not by virtue of any difference in terms of their underlying uh, ground truth score. So um, from a psychological um, psychometric lens, a machine learning uh, measurement bias uh, is defined as differential functioning, uh, as you can kind of see from kind of the two different group lines. Um, of the trained machine learning model between subgroups. And machine learning measurement bias can empirically manifest when a trained machine learning model produces different predicted score levels for the same ground truth level, um, and or when the model yields different predictive accuracies across subgroups. So the model is not as accurate uh, for, let's say, a minority group as compared to a majority group. So as we kind of um, approach it from you know, a psychological lens, we're thinking as well about what the sources of machine learning biases might be. Uh, this includes uh, data bias, um, which is defined as a non-equivalence in terms of the data inputs uh, between subgroups. So for instance, when we're using uh, videos um, to uh, score individuals on personality, we might be using human raters to rate those videos uh, that then forms the ground truth score so that we're using machine learning models to mimic human raters. It might be that the raters were biased in the first place when they were doing uh, ratings of these uh, videos, right? So here we're focused on kind of the data aspects here, the ground truth data and also the extracted features. And just kind of giving you a high level example of you know, what the issues might be so for instance, with regard to measurement bias itself, it might be that um, when we're kind of doing the surveys um, that form the ground truth data in which we're using the machine learning models to predict, let's say in terms of personality, men might be using the personality scales differently than women that result in different subgroup scores. Mm -hmm. So possible mitigation strategy would be, we need to ensure measurement equivalence on the survey scales themselves that form the ground truth data. Uh, next might be, you know, in terms of social cognitive biases in the annotations. So as I mentioned, in terms of the video ratings, females might be rated more severely in conscientiousness due to stereotypes. And so it's very important then to train and standardize the procedures for those annotations and ensure that we have an aggregation across diverse raters. The other thing that can lead to uh, non-equivalence, especially in terms of predictive accuracies, 
is really kind of having um, the training um, sample, right, um, not be fully inclusive. So the machine learning uh, model is being trained on considerably different proportions of subgroups. And it may actually weight one subgroup more than another. So mitigation strategy might be to use the same numbers of individuals for subgroups of interest within your machine learning uh, training itself. Or it might be that the training sample has males with higher conscientiousness than females. And so when you're training the machine learning model, it's actually using gender as a proxy uh, for let's say higher ability. And so um, that creates possible biases. Uh, and it's very important then as a mitigation strategy to ensure that for your um, ground truth distribu distributions, you're matching the subgroups as well in terms of the machine learning model training. Uh, the other aspect is in terms of the features being computed. Remember, uh, we have the raw data and then we are computing features um, from this raw data. Um, there could be just non-equivalence between behavior expressions and the features that are computed. So for instance, lower income individuals might have less features computed despite the same level of behavior expressions due to poor internet connectivity. So we really need to uh, exclude computed features that perhaps review substantial differences between subgroups. Um, or that the feature computation modules themselves might be biases. So it's been known that uh, things like automated uh, speech recognition algorithms are less precise for dialects relative to majority group speech or what is considered codified standardized uh, standard speech. So we need to examine you know, uh, features, computation methods for possible biases themselves. And then with regard to algorithm uh, training biases, uh, so algorithms are developed with non-equivalence in the relation between the extracted uh, features and the ground truth data. So what we're looking at is really um, the linkage here, that this might not be equivalent between subgroups of interest. Um, so as you can see here, uh, algorithm training biases, uh, uh, some issues um, that uh, can occur um, you're actually using different features for different subgroups. And sometimes within the data science literature, uh, really isn't much close attention to that. <clears throat> uh, they're creating different algorithms that use different features or weight features differently for different subgroups in order to maximize accuracy. However, if you think about it from a psychometric angle, we're using in a way two different rulers to measure uh, the same attribute uh, between different subgroups. So for instance, for instance, differentially weighting facial expression features might lead to lower scores for younger individuals compared to older individuals. And a possible mitigation strategy is then to use a common algorithm for both subgroups. Um, the other thing is that you know, the trained algorithms are not actually yielding the same machine learning uh, scores or are not equally predictive um, between subgroups. Um, and so, an example here might be, you know, including facial expression features leads to lower scores for older individuals compared to younger individuals. Um, and this could be uh, a sign that your a priori, a priori data uh, might have biases that are included. And so you need to start going back to uh, exclude uh, such potential bias features. So um, I've kind of talked a lot about kind of you know, machine learning measurement bias and how machine learning measurement bias sources can occur, especially if you are a creator of these machine learning um, assessments or big data uh, measurements. Um, and I believe that while some of us will become creators of these models, many of us will be users of it to conduct the assessments. So question is, you know, what next based on our understanding of machine learning measurement bias and, you know, the sources of biases. So. Uh, first recommendation is, you know, to think carefully about whether the trained machine learning model has been evaluated on your subgroups of interest. So, for example, and this is, uh, has been a famous example, um, while facial recognition has high levels of accuracy in general, um, the data sets for evaluating accuracy contain mostly lighter skinned individuals. So aligned with this framework, while Lam uh, Winnie and Timnet Gebru proposed 
a balanced sample of both gender and skin type to evaluate machine learning measurement bias or term bias in the paper. And they found that a trained machine learning model uh, had higher accuracies for lighter skinned men, but comparatively lower accuracy, accuracies for darker skinned uh, women. So it's very important to figure out whether these machine learning models have actually been evaluated. So as, as you kind of look at the technical specifications uh, to examine that. Uh, second question is to start thinking about whether the machine learning model trained on data uh, are trained on data that have similar characteristics across subgroups, right? So a lack of equivalence in subgroup samples during the machine learning model training might cause machine learning measurement bias. For instance, uh, using predominantly male samples to train Amazon's resume, resume screener may have led to machine learning measurement bias when men were selected at a higher rate as compared to women. Um, and third, um, consider the question of are the platform data inputs for training the machine learning model, um, are they likely used similarly between subgroups? Um, so uh, the platform data inputs, so social media platforms, internet search searches, for instance. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, Black Americans uh, use African-American vernacular English on Twitter, whereas uh, white Americans do not. And it's been found that machine learning models can systematically classify content aligned with African-American English dialect as harmful at a higher rate than content aligned with white English. Um, and fourth, as a consumer of uh, machine learning model uh, or machine learning or big data measurement products, it's important to ask and investigate whether you know, the trained machine learning models uh, differ across subgroups. So, uh, the machine learning model is explicitly different between subgroups. Uh, for example, uh, subgroup norming of features in machine learning model is common in computer science. Um, however, um, uh, our research shows that using gender normed uh, machine learning features in the context of automated interviews did not find that it substantially uh, reduced machine learning uh, measurement bias. And itself, uh, using that, we're actually using two different uh, rulers, as it were, to assess um, different gender groupings. Um, so we might be actually introducing additional uh, measurement bias there. So um, I hope that um, through this talk, you can kind of see the importance of big data for psychology, how psychology, you know, with its really um, interest in measurement can advance um, uh, thinking in terms of big data measurement and also in terms of um, uh, big data measurement bias or machine learning measurement bias itself. So I'll open this time for um, Q&A and I will pass the time over to um, Justin to facilitate that. Uh, thanks uh, for, the, for a great presentation and, and uh, I'll, I'll do a brief bit of facilitation here if that's all right. Um, I think it was a, a you know a really nice overview of the uh, some of the dynamics around the landscape that still needs to be made. And what I mean by that is we've had decades, if not a century and a half, of psychology research looking at things like what does validity look like, what does rigor look like, and so on. And yet, within the domain of uh, big data, we don't have that same broad scale background. And a lot of what you're talking about here, uh, especially as you detailed and, and split out the, the dynamics of bias and related challenges, these are the areas that are still quite honestly like open territory. We, we don't know all of the challenges. And as you met, mentioned Timnit with her uh, previous experience with, uh, with Google, it's not always something that organizations are necessarily terribly willing to hear feedback on. Um, because of the, the dynamics that are affiliated. So I think you, you really, on the one hand, provided a solid overview of big data methods within uh, psychology and generally human subjects research. On the flip side, you also surfaced uh, the fact that many of the methods and the approaches that need to be explored in order to advance the quality of this research are still being formed as uh, the research is ongoing. And even just the different uh, notion of what bias might be and how that might be expressed in different populations is critical. And, and the, the weirdest article or that, that you referenced early on, I think, sort of got at some of that 
just before I direct to questions, if anyone has questions, feel free to type them into the into the chat bot. I just want to reference the uh, the Learning Analytics Learning Network and some of the work that's been done there. And, and I, I bring that in because we had a presentation last year um, of, uh, that looked specifically at open science, the concerns of open science and being able to address even some at, at a data collection level, some of the biases that might exist. Um, those of you that might be a little bit newer to this field of uh, big data uh, may not be as, as aware of the models being built inherently are backwards facing because we're taking existing sets of data and we're either testing our algorithms against those data or we're building our algorithms from uh, those data. And that then means that when you're trying to uh, forecast something in the future, your model actually has an inherent backward facing lens and ways around that at uh, from an open science perspective, which was the, the learning analytics learning network that I just dropped the link in um, is, is really important area uh, to consider and to explore. Um, and also just briefly give a shout out to the learning analytics learning network work that was started actually came, I think, as a result of a failed NSF grant with a colleague, Ryan Baker um, from UPenn and uh, colleagues uh, out of Australia and, uh, and UTA. And so over the last several years, I guess, we've had something about 30 some odd events that Justin has coordinated and facilitated with a colleague, Florence Gabriel, out of Australia as well. It's a fantastic resource uh, for, for different aspects in, within the learning analytics field. So the first question, I'm just looking at it quickly, so I'm going to read this in real time, so uh, hopefully that will work for you. Um, but in psychology, surveys are often used to collect the ground truth. It is well known that the data collected by a survey are not uh, weak enough since users tend to fill them in arbitrarily. This can influence the reliability of the machine learning model. Um, did you want to comment on that? I'm not quite clear on the not weak enough uh, section of that, but uh, I'll direct it for you to have a, a run through it. Yeah, so, you know, um, certainly it's very important to start thinking about what we're using as the outcomes or the ground truth that our machine learning, learning models are predicting. Um, and it's increasingly, I mean, researchers are increasingly now aware um, that the reliability of the ground truth data will affect, quote unquote, the reliability or the accuracy of the machine learning models themselves. So certainly, you know, if you're using ground truth survey data that is highly unreliable, then uh, it's unlikely that you have uh, quote unquote something that is more reliable than what you have in terms of the machine learning model assessments. And another perspective of thinking about it too is in terms of you know annotations. So you know another way of looking at reliability is in terms of inter-rater agreement, right? So that's an inter-rater agreement of let's say how well I did on my talk. If there's very wide variation it might actually indicate that people are using different bits of information and there isn't a clear consensus of what, you know, let's say the quality of the talk. Um, and so the machine learning will not be able to perform well as well because this actually reveals that the source of the data or something about the construct is unclear. And so the machine learning model is not able to predict it, that. So I think uh, we need to start thinking at very foundational levels, even in terms of, what does this? What can this data tell us? What can this, you know, specific channel of of information reveal? Um, in order to really think carefully about the use of machine learning models to predict something of interest, uh, you know, rather than willy nilly just throwing machine learning model assessments at anything just because you think, oh, maybe there could be some signal here. Um, and so I think that's uh, very important to think through conceptually. Can I just get right to this for the meat and the potatoes part of the question uh, related to uh, methodologies. And so from your perspective, you've written on this, you've published it, uh, you've, you've uh, you think the interesting article uh, that you did last year with DeMello, uh, we think where you were lead, the 2021 article where DeMello was lead that you shared some of the, the slides from earlier. Uh, the, there's a methodology question here, which is how do we train, if you will, upcoming students in light of some big data opportunities? Is Do you see there being an evolution where more of the training being done moves away from some of the current models and approaches to conducting research within psychology that starts to lean more and more towards big data models where greater emphasis needs to be placed on things that you were talking about here, such as data collection, the, uh, the bias that's inherent in that, the models that we're training and developing and so on, or should we still retain the 
fairly heavy traditional methodology lens in psychology programs and less of a focus on the big data end. I mean, so it's a bit of a sloppy question, but what I'm trying to get at is if you were to train your students right now, obviously you are, but what, where would you put them on the experimental uh, design through to big data continuum in terms of priority? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I view it as augmentation rather than replacement. Um, I think that the strength of psychology is to be able to think carefully about research design. You know, what are the sources of, of our data? What are the possible confounds if we have to make a claim? Um, and how are we analyzing the data and designing the experiment, let's say, uh, in order to make those claims? Um, so I think that is really foundational and that's what psychology has to bring to the table. And also even thinking carefully about the constructs and behaviors as well, which you know, I think in inter interdisciplinary co uh, collaborations, um, just having that approach is very, very helpful. Um, with regard to um, you know, these newer quote unquote analytical approaches and maybe you know, working with organic data, how would you scrape data and so forth? Um, I think certainly it will be helpful to uh, know at least at a high level how it's being done in order to understand the possible gaps and then also be able to do quote unquote fancier regression, <laughs> really because a lot of these models are you know, uh, fancier quote unquote regression type approaches. Again, not all of it, but a lot of what is being used right now um, uh, is the case. Um, and really kind of being able to understand that, you know, like, like oh, the, the whole, what is the training process for a machine learning model, for instance, um, and then uh, be able to converse with uh, folks within the data science and computer science uh, arenas or disciplines, I should say, um, and I think be able to kind of think through with them. Uh, and so I, I think that it is certainly going to be very helpful if you can run all these models uh, yourself, but at the same time, you know, the, I would say, you know, a lot of these modeling approaches are constantly improving uh, at light speed compared to psychology. <laughs> and so uh, it is helpful to be able to collaborate well with folks who are, you know, up to date with kind of the latest modeling approaches, for instance, um, to be able to, um, you know, do a project well. So I don't expect a student to have uh, necessarily every single skill in terms of modeling or data science, but certainly be able to be competent enough to uh, run basic models and to have conversations with um, computer scientists on uh, what they're trying to do as a research project. I think that is really uh, going to be an important skill to have. Well, that leads, I think, to, to another question. Uh, obviously, one of the things we want to do with the with Learning Analytics Learning Network is to create a space where skills can be developed around data literacy and uh, you know, some of these emerging approaches, uh, if you will. So from, from your perspective, are you, do you have sort of an inventory of uh, data literacies that you would expect uh, you know, perhaps colleagues that you collaborated with or students to have? And, and the reason I'm asking is we, we've taken within the Learning Analytics, uh, our master's program, this view that you're inevitably going to be working on teams. And so your, your team may have someone who is you know, fantastic in certain data science applications. Your team may be someone who's uh, you know, skilled uh, with, with things like cleaning data or, or is a programmer and can, can do uh, wonderful things with getting data, unstructured data, particularly into a functional shape to start working with. Your team may have people who are great with constructs uh, and able to understand, you know, these are the indicators of the, the presence of these kinds of attributes within this construct. So those are the kinds of approaches that we're promoting in, in terms of uh, as much, not specifically the technical skills, but the capability to speak across subgroups of technical, pedagogical, scientific skills, if you will. So from your end, would, is that how you see it as well? Or do you see it more, look, there needs to be basic uh, data literacies that everyone needs to have before they can start speaking across these various subgroups. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, it's key in communication to be able to have the same terminologies. And so when working in a collaborative group, it's very important 
uh, when somebody says privacy or differential privacy, that somebody uh, who is working in that team understands the basic concepts. So I think it's very important um, from a learning analytics standpoint or from a programming, programming standpoint to be able to um, have these concepts very, very clearly stated uh, so that somebody understands what it means. Uh, for instance, when they say a training data set, for instance, that might be different from an evaluation data set, right? So um, being able to understand kind of uh, conceptually what these components are will be, I think, foundational uh, from a quote unquote uh, hard skills perspective. And then certainly I believe that, you know, you learn best by doing. <laughs> and so uh, actually taking on or tackling a, a research project where you actually have to apply some of these uh, and then start to do some of, you know, the, the modeling itself. Um, I think that's going to be important in terms of figuring out how you work in a team um, and then uh, the basics of modeling, for instance. And then uh, the other piece would be really, I think, um, I would say more in terms of character um, to develop good listening skills and humility. Uh, I think very often uh, teams don't work together, even if you have the most brilliant minds, it's because nobody's listening to each other, <laughs> right? It's kind of like everybody wants to have their say and they think they're right. Uh, but I think in, in uh, these kinds of interdisciplinary teams, it's very, very important to be able to work well as a team, to be able to kind of think about the way a possible um, blind spots might be. And in fact, a lot of uh, companies are going to be interviewing candidates have those qualities and not somebody who thinks that they are a superstar and think that they know everything. And so I think willingness to learn humility, uh, again, because everything is developing so quickly. So you really need to be able to listen well, continue to learn. Um, and I think that would um, set you up uh, for you know, a really uh, successful collaboration. Great. Well, I think on uh, it's a fantastic return to the emphasis of social skills or skills uh, that, that like listening, I think is, is an outstanding illustration of, of just how how uh, that capability to function within a team setting work with others, especially when you're trying to explore large data sets that may hold a range of different potential uh, opportunities for, for researchers and developing those soft skills is central to that. I think at that point, I'm going to end the recording here. I want to say a particular thank you to uh, uh, Professor Tay for I think it was an outstanding conversation and part of a growing set of resources that we'll have available on, on the site to help advance this general idea of big data within psychology and specifically within the domain of learning analytics. Thanks all for joining. We have more events coming up, as Justin noted, over the next a uh, few weeks and we have an, an entire planned schedule of big data psychology talks that will be uh, starting in early 2022. So hope you all have an outstanding rest of your day and rest of your week. Take care.